Welcome to Making Chips. We believe that manufacturing is challenging, but if you are connected to a community of leaders, you can elevate your skills, solve your problems, and grow your business. I'm your host, Jason Zenger, and I'm joined by my co-host, Jim Carr. Jim, how you doing, buddy? Good. Feels good, good to be feels good to be back. We're back home in Chicago. At MXD in Goose Island, Illinois. It's it's always good to be here. And I've said this many, many times. You know, I always I feel the the excitement of the manufacturing facility here and what's what what the, what they're trying to accomplish here at MXD. Well, not so. only that, we can't lay on the beach in California for no. you know a week. We at a time. could if we wanted to, but, but we have businesses to run. Yes, but that was fun last week. As a matter of fact, it was. It yeah. was good. We had a good so, time. Let me. I have a thought for you. Yeah. When your dad. You want me to think? Um, you're gonna have to put okay. on your thinking hat, buddy. Okay. Go ahead. When your dad owned Car Machine, did you ever think about you know leaving him and starting your own business? I did. You did. When, what did that look like? It wasn't a manufacturing company. Oh, really? It was okay. not a manufacturing a bar? company. It was, it, at one point, it was a bar. Okay. Um, but then, you know, I've always had this affinity for the music industry, and I've always had this affinity for marketing. So if I could go back, and I probably still would do this, I probably would do marketing for the music industry in some capacity if I were given the opportunity to go mm-hmm. back working in time. for somebody or working for yourself uh, no probably like you know I've I've always been um, admired like uh, people in pop music that there's limited talent but they've made it super big in in the industry and it, it I've always wondered well it was probably because they just had this they developed this great marketing team that just exploited the the heck out of them and you know because there's so many people just like anybody that goes into professional sports I mean the competition at that level is so uniquely competitive that you know, you, you just need something else. You need an edge. You need marketing. You need something to push you over the top because at the end of the day, there's a lot of competition in a lot of industries, and I believe that through a marketing, a really good executed marketing plan, you can do that. So that would be your marketing company or that would be working for somebody else? Um, what I, I'm trying to get I don't at- know. I, do, I don't know if I would necessarily have started my own. I probably would have gained experience through working for somebody. Well, what I'm trying to get at is, yes. you know, I... I Entrepreneurship is a um, is a funny thing, and you know there's a lot of us that work for ourselves that mm-hmm. you know may or may not have started our own businesses. They might have been you know part of a family legacy, um, but you know sometimes I don't feel like I'm I'm somebody that could ever work for somebody else. So and and we have a special guest on the show today. We do. Who we're going to talk about entrepreneurship and growth and financing and I've content seen his creation and, and stuff like that. And, you know, I feel like, you know, he's probably someone also that couldn't work for somebody else. But he probably did at one time. And I'm sure well, we all talk do. about that. We all do. Yeah. I, I never have. Never. Uh, no, you worked at a bar, remember? Part time. Right. You didn't yeah. own that bar. Never full time. Right. I've had the same full time job my entire career. Right. Can you believe that? Um. It's true. You just told me. I know. So tell and me I'm t- telling them at a working nation right now, too. <laughs> so tell me so something great going on a car. Um, lots of shipping going on in the last okay. week, uh, finally, because we can invoice all that and, you know, uh, get some net 30 payments in. So, yeah, that's a big thing. Um, business continues to be really, really strong. We just had um, a company in from... Alabama, quite frankly, yesterday, a major player in the aerospace um, industry, and they were super happy. They did an audit on us, and they left, and it was really, really positive um, when we showed them our What kind of an audit? It was a a, a quality and business audit. So they come in, you fill out all these qualifications prior to them coming in. You know, what what do you have in place? What quality systems do you have in place? They're kind of reinventing like ISO or something like that for themselves. No, no, they want to, they want to, you know, anybody can put on paper what, anybody can put on paper what they want you to think and see. Of course. But when you, when they actually, when people come in and physically meet each other and see what's really going on at a company, that's when it comes black and white. That's when the clouds part. And that's when the sun starts to shine either in a negative way or not. So it was super positive. I Kudos to my entire team. Everyone had a unique role in delivering what this audit was all about, and I was really proud of my team. That's so, great. Yeah, thanks. How about you? Tell me what's happening at Zangers. Um, I'm. Do you work? I I, I feel I work very hard. <laughs> do you do, but you don't go in that often, do you? 
Um, so I have a schedule. Okay. And I work out of my home office on oh, that's right. Mondays yes, and Fridays. That. Okay. And then I'm I a little envious. Of I that. work in Illinois on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I work in Indiana on Wednesdays. Which, okay. So today I actually cut my day in the office short in Indiana and drove up um, here to MXD from Indiana. Took the Skyway. I don't Thank like you. paying for the Skyway, but I wanted to make sure I got here on time. Thank you. So. I appreciate you being here. Yeah, so what's going on new? Um, I'm actually thinking about introducing a um, a role in my company. And, you know, the role can be best characterized by a title that I don't want to use because it seems too don't give it away. in nature. No, the title is, and my wife was giving me kind of pushback on it because she thought it was more of a, a political title than a business title. But I said it's becoming more popular in the business environment. I'm going to write it down. Okay. Um, I am going to be creating a chief of staff um, position. However, I don't think I'm going to call it chief of staff because I don't want to use the word chief. Because I don't want to use the word chief. So I think it's going to be called um, director of staff. And basically, it's kind of a position that where this person is going to um, utilize like the, the the staff resources that we have and execute things on my behalf and even communicate on my behalf because I just you know I, I need to multiply myself I guess you would say and That's I, I want to do it in it, it is a big role and I have a special person in mind for it somebody that I trust and that I don't have to over explain things to me. No. Oh, okay. No. I do I don't not need- I do not want to work with you any more than I have to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with me in the metal work. And I I don't even know if I want to share a hotel room with you again. <laughs> <laughs> we won't get th- we won't go there, but we will get into the gruesomeness no. of that. No. <laughs> Thank you for that. We may even want to edit that out. No, I think it's fine. <laughs> You're gross, and you know the metalworking nation needs to know that. <laughs> so, um, for manufacturing news, I actually have something that is, um, yeah, it's, it's not really not, a news not, article. It's not exactly news, and it's not exactly manufacturing. But um, I was listening to a podcast, and it had the title "How to Create a Thriving Workplace Culture." You know, we've talked about this before. I listen to a lot of podcasts. Is what I do in the car. You listen to music. I listen to podcasts. Yes, that's true. And um, they had an idea and they um, they cited a trend, um, which I thought was interesting, where um, in order to foster an environment where you could have people who were at different points in their careers, different ages, different um, objectives, that if you provided more options, um, you could cultivate a better working environment. And what I'm referring to here is like some like, simple things. Okay. So like, here's a couple examples that they gave. Um, one of them was like, if you have, so your, your companies, you have what, like six, seven people. Yes. Okay. Seven. So I have about 45 and you can't in two different dynamic. Yeah. You, it's hard to get like all those people together at one time. And so nearly impossible. And also people want to consume information differently. Like people listen to, uh, podcasts people read and people watch videos you know there's all different kind people read books so there's all you know different ways to consume content so what they suggested if you're gonna have like an all-company meeting like a, a town hall or something like that don't make it mandatory and offer it in different ways so offer people to show up in person offer people to stream the town hall or the meeting and you know text in or or post questions that they have and also offer people to consume the video at you know two times speed at a later time if they want to and so because different people just you know you might have a younger generation he's like i want to i want to hear this at double time like i get too much jim carr and if i can go through him and what he has to say that much quicker or too much jason's anger i don't know um that's what i want that's Hmm. probably a younger person i don't know how i I don't know how i feel about this I understand. Yeah. You might have an, an, another person who says, I like to be there in person. I like to stand up and ask a question. And I like just to be, to see that the, the CEO of my company who's, you know, talking about whatever subject matter that it may be. But you're offering I think, different I options. Think, I think that negates the whole objective of bringing people together at the table and sharing and collaborating. It's got its pros and cons. It definitely does. So, so here's I, another. I, I'm not like super sold on that quite Un- yet. I, I'll think about it and listen to what you're so saying. So the whole but, idea, yeah. is what I'm referring to, is just offering options for multi generation. So the second thing would be, instead of just offering like a 401k or some other kind of pension and saying this is it, um, or some kind of re- matching on that on that pension, say you know we'll offer you a pension or we'll pay down some of your student loan debt. So now you're offering something. You don't mean a traditional pension plan. Those are no, kind of well, absolute. Well, a 401k right? is considered a pension. Yeah, but that's not, you know, it's not the, the pension plan def- that our parents knew. You're thinking of like a defined benefit Pe- pension. Yeah, yeah. Th- those are gone. Yeah. So that's not what I'm referring They're to. They're not sustainable. So, so to clarify, instead of offering 
a 401k only, maybe you might say, I want to offer a 401k or I will offer to pay down your student loan debt. Hmm. So you're offering options for di- different generations. Mm-hmm. Something to think about. Something to think about as an, as an, as an option to enhance your culture. You're, you're offering options in order to foster a good environment amongst multi-generations. Well, the people only, in their 20s, the, people in their 30s, people in their 40s, and so on. Well, here's what I like about that. I like that you're thinking outside of the box because we all know how hard it is to attract and retain new talent. So you're thinking about things that are different. Different attracts new people, new ideas, mm-hmm. new talent to your right. company and to your brand. Um, but... I don't necessarily know that they're immediately giving me a warm fuzzy inside on on what they mean to me. Um, What do you mean? Well, like I just said, I don't necessarily know if I like the idea of streaming or videotaping your town hall meetings because I believe a company meeting should be a physical thing where everybody engages. It should be mandatory. I don't care if you come in and just stay for 10 or 15 minutes. I'm not, you're, you don't have to be there forever. We're not talking about like um, when we talk about like our level 10 meetings. I'm not referring no, to that you're type talking of about a like meeting. A field I'm talking trip. about like, no, no, no. Uh, what I'm talking about is, you know, when the lead person at the company comes up and makes a presentation in the company and says, this is where we're going. This is why we're going there. Or says, I'm, I'm here to answer your questions. Okay. Get, not like no, a, colla- okay. not like a collaboration meeting. Because, okay. You know, okay. that, that might be, be so different. a meeting where you're going to educate them on something. Gotcha. Or, or answer questions. Sure. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And the, and the college pay down thing. What if what if you don't you have somebody that works for you that never went to college? Well, then they can do, take the four hundred one k option. Okay. Once again, oh, you're, you're is offering that an, options. Is that an or? The whole point is that you're offering the ors. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So could you introduce our guest? Let's I like would, move on. I with would the be show. thrilled to. I would be thrilled to. I was uh, driving here today, and I'm like, I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting this guy. He's uh, you know, he's got a lot to talk about. So uh, and I've got a lot of questions in my head already. I might go off script a little bit. But Just wait don't. till the end, okay? All right, we'll do. So uh, this gentleman we have here in the MXD studio, his name is John Saunders, and you probably heard that name before. He is the owner of Saunders Machine Works and the face behind NYC CNC, his YouTube channel. He started his machining endeavors 10 years ago in his personal apartment. He is an influencer among manufacturers with over 300,000 subscribers on YouTube and a massive following on Instagram. He is a bootstrapper and serial entrepreneur that has gone from just a YouTuber to business owner. Please welcome John Saunders to the Making Chip Studio. John, welcome. Thanks for having me. Appreciate yeah, it, guys. Welcome, John. You're welcome. So, John, you are, as, as Jim said, you're an entrepreneur at heart. Um Unlike Jim and I, you did not join a family business. Um, why machining and why entrepreneurship? So I uh, grew up as a competitive rifle shooter. And the short version of a 10-year-plus story is I um, stopped shooting competitively and was just doing so recreationally and uh, had a, an idea for a product. And at the time, um, I was actually in college for entrepreneurship, but I still made the mistake that I think a lot of folks make, which is they confuse a product with a business opportunity, or they confuse a product with entrepreneurship. And and really, I think a lot of folks that I look up to and have learned from would tell you that a product is 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 probably the least important part. It's still important, but the least important part behind what truly is uh, the opportunity to execute on that idea through the resources you have, through the team that you build, that you put together, and the value and the offering that you deliver. Um, you know, before we hit the record button today, we were talking about marketing and how important it is to be able to con- find out who your audience is, what are you selling, why should they buy this? And You're talking about the why behind what you what you do. Say again? Are you talking about the why? Yeah, exactly. What you do? So, so he, like Jim and I, we want to equip and inspire manufacturing leaders. The product could be a lot of different things. Sure, sure. Uh, and for me, I, I had the passion, and I was a you know potential customer myself or an end user, but um, I was probably one of the worst people you could have picked to start this company because at the time, I didn't know a bridge port from an end mill. I'd never made things. Um, I didn't have any uh, time or experience sourcing products from vendors. And this kind of hit a low point for me when 
Um, I had, you know, I was, I'm, I'm resourceful. I'm scrappy. I'd got on the internet. I'd found uh, an engineer to help us out, and he had hired uh, his machine shop contacts, his sheet metal contacts, to start creating designs and ideas and products. And somebody finally asked about a tolerance, and I, I answered like a carpenter. Plus or minus a sixteenth. Yeah, no, seriously. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know what a thou was. Yeah, and so I thought this this isn't going to work. And this I'm telling this with the benefit of hindsight. It was a little bit muddier at the time going through it, but. I'd graduated college. I'd moved to uh, New York City. I was working at a day job. And I thought, you know what? Uh, if I'm going to be an entrepreneur and, and help myself, I need to figure some of this stuff out. So I, I wouldn't call it a whim, but it was a pretty pretty big leap of faith. Um, I bought a benchtop CNC machine while I was living in Manhattan and stuffed it. Literally, there's like an iconic photo that I use in presentations where it's, it's literally uh, next to the pillow of my twin bed. Wow. Wow. Were you making chips? I was, yeah. um, and and it was uh, again with the benefit of hindsight, inc- a wonderful time uh, to be doing this and to be in New York City doing it. Uh, YouTube was just coming about. Uh, blogs were getting more popular. Forums were getting more popular, and then we had this kind of. Uh, renaissance maker movement, which I'm not sure how much overlaps with the Making Chips audience, but certainly at, at my level back then, you have maker spaces coming about, you have 3D printers coming about, you have uh, software like Autodesk Fusion 360, which is letting more folks gain access to CAD and CAM that works. You've got uh, Arduino, which is a huge thing for me as a small physical computing device so that I could actually prototype. You know, I built my pro- first target out of popsicle sticks, and then I built one out of Lego. Uh, what's the Lego robotics kit called? Um, I know my all not my kids Technics, are... but there was there's a robotic yeah. Lego that has a WYSIWYG software editor. Right. Um, and then I realized, wait, I can do this with Arduino, which meant I'm actually in DigiKey now buying, you know, real sensors and and that was an important part because when I did start talking to folks to kind of get contract manufacturing for this product, um, the few I found that were willing to work with us, I think worked with me because they said this kid's going to figure this out one way or the other because good grief, look at what he's done. You know, I took a 80-pound benchtop CNC machine and was machining four-inch long 4140 parts in six setups over the course of three or four weeks. I was going to wow. I was going to do this one way or the other. Um, and I think that's an important You part. learned a lot really quick. Well, and, I was, and I didn't realize it at the time, but I was selling myself. I was showing up saying, this is what I have done. I had a Pelican case with all these parts in it and, and circuit boards and things and... It was kind of a, if you guys are interested, if this is a good fit, let's work together. If not, I'm going on to the next guy. Right, exactly. That's what it's all about. So my turn for my question now, and I, I just have a couple things off. The, well, first of all, welcome to Chicago. Thank you. Yeah. Good I'm to sure, be here. Yeah, I bet. I bet I, Chicago. I am on vacation, so at any point in time, I may have to leave immediately to resume the we, uh, recreational activities. I get you, and I, I hope you enjoy your stay here <laughs> Thank in you. Chicago. Um, but the rifle, were you a trap, a, uh, trap shooter? No, it was a uh, small bore indoor so okay. kind of like the, okay. like the Olympic style, you would see you of prone and offhand. Okay. My dad was almost a professional trap shooter. Oh, wow. He was class double A trap shooter for all the time. That was with, really hard. It was really hard. I mean, yeah. he, he tried won and... many, many, many awards in, in that when he was, you know, a young man. So my, my wife, who showed me up when we were in Texas, because you know she grew up knowing how to use a gun, and she beat me in trap shooting. So it was quite embarrassing. That's okay. <laughs> anyway. Um, Making Chips contends that small manufacturers are at the heart of our industry, and our very own Christine Schmitz wrote an article, Small But Mighty, that discusses the topic, and Chris Fox, our creative director, has even said on our YouTube channel that manufacturing is going to shrink, which gets into this topic. According to the government, all of us in this room would be extremely small businesses. Tell us about your shop and what you do there. Sure. Are so, you an extremely small shop? Oh, yes. I, I think I would, would win that award in this room. <laughs> um, so I moved back to Zanesville, Ohio, which is where I grew up about five years ago. Um, had spent 10 years in New York City. Loved it, but um, I wanted to pursue this manufacturing thing. Um, and long story short, we now run a company called Saunders Machine Works. Um, ends up that NYC CNC, while very well recognized on YouTube for this industry, not a great uh, brick and mortar name, a little difficult to say. And uh, the New York City part was part of our story, but but not part of the present business of what we do. So gotcha. Saunders Machine Works, uh, we have a 10,000 square foot shop. Uh, we do three things. Um, we run the YouTube channel, which for me is uh, not only a just a a thing I love and enjoy, but, um, and this is going to sound a little cliche, but it's my one little chance to change the world. You're so, giving back to the community. 
Yeah, well, and yeah. just the numbers are insane. I, I, and I don't track this stuff regularly, but the last time I looked, um, since you and I have been sitting here talking, something like 125 hours of our videos have been watched. Wow. That's so awesome. you start to realize, wait a minute here, this is this is incredible. So you can inspire people. You can reach out to people. Uh, and the story started with, with me in New York City not knowing what a fly cutter was and surface footage and so forth. Um, so we run the YouTube channel. Um, we have a training facility. So folks come in uh, every month, and we do training classes on CAD, CAM, machining, fixturing, work holding, et cetera. And with, with students or with people that are just um, green in the, from the industry? Anybody. Oh, okay. Any Almost all age ranges. We've had as young as 14 to as old as 88. And you conduct those classes? Uh, I used to teach most of them, and we now have a full-time teacher. Oh, great. Yep. Uh, and then the the real bread and butter of the business is uh, the quote unquote Saunders Machine Works brand, where we make uh, machining products, mostly fixture plates, and we have a vice style work holding thing we call the Mod Vice, which has proven to be quite popular. So, so we is, are it, is a, that a product line? It John? is a product line. Yes. Okay. So you're not doing contract CNC machining like I would do at Car Machine, where a customer sends you a print uh, or a 3D CAD model and says, you know, how yeah, I need 20 of these. What is it going to take? What is it going to, you know, what is it going to cost? How many, how much lead time do you need? We did do that for a number of years. And the answer is I don't do that anymore. Okay, it's part of the process of of growing as an entrepreneur is learning to learning the N word. No, I, I need, right. I need oh, help with that. Yes. No. Yeah, it's um, tough. So we actually do still do it for a very, very select number of customers. Probably sure. jobs you had already proven out. Exactly. Well, customers that and we... customers and, that you and know. That, and that yeah. goes back to really resonated with what you said about marketing yourself. And I am I can machine a great part. I can machine a part that is certainly within the specs that the customer needs, but I am not a great machinist. Okay. I'm just simply not. I've not been doing it that long. I'm, I'm, I'm smart. I'm, I'm hungry. I enjoy it. But I would not put myself up against a tool and die maker that may work at your shop, period. But that's not what I'm selling. The reason that's that not who you are. That's not your brand, right? That's no, 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 yeah. no, no, no. What I mean is the customers that we've kept on. It's kind of funny because they could go to other shops, and then Frank, there are probably people that may be a little bit cheaper. There may be people who are better, quote unquote, machinists. But it's not what I'm selling. Isn't just what gets put in a box or on a skid and sent off. What you're selling is the sort of experience of working with somebody. Meaning, is that the kind of shop that's able to realize, wait a minute, here you've got an interference fit here, or just dealing with clear communication, not missing deadlines. I may not be the great machinist, but I will keep you informed. We will get ahead of things, and I will work my butt off to hit deadlines. And that's what's awesome to me about the kind of American dream is you don't have to be a third-generation person with multi-million dollar equipment to just do a really good job at right. well, shipping the product. I, I think as much as people talk about, you know, like all these industries are being commoditized and everything, and, you know, Jim, you know, you struggle with, like, pri we all struggle with pricing. Um, I, I st you know, it's it's just it's never going to be completely commoditized. There's still that, you know, that, that personal experience that you bring to it. You know, you always talk about communication, Jim. It's huge. You know, we always talk about the experience that we give to our, our clients as well. And you're, you're absolutely right. Um, so before we hit record, you also mentioned you went to an entrepreneurial college. Yep. Um, and we've talked a lot on the show how being in the CNC machining industry is one of the highest paying jobs that you can get without a college education. However, you know, it's good for some, good for others. I think it just depends on, you know, your objectives. But how has your, tell us about your education. How has that education, you know, shaped your business? Uh, it's a, that's a good question. It uh, is a good question. Uh, I think it gives me a comfort level to sort of, sort of speak the lingo. You know, like I didn't know what a thou was when I had these first products trying to bring to market, but I did know the basics of contract law. I did know some stuff about uh, marketing, you know, what's marketing versus advertising. Stuff that's not that complicated, but until you've had the ability to digest it, think about it, see in the context of case studies or examples, um, it doesn't make you more, <laughs> how do you say it? It doesn't necessarily make you more likely to be successful, but it's certainly a step in the right direction to be able to be critically thinking. Um, but I think ultimately, in a, in a funny kind of way, it was being in New York for 10 years and seeing how kind of cutthroat and how much you've got to uh, watch your back and everyone's... everyone's was, it, was it cutthroat? Oh, yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. More so than in, is it Zanesville? Correct. Ohio? Oh, Definitely. yeah, totally I different. I mean, like, completely different dynamic. Just totally different. Okay. Yes. yes. Um, and it's not just the day job in New York. It's life in New York. It's 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 hustling. It's fast. And yeah, exactly. You're not uh, going to sit still on the sidewalk. You might get pushed right. over. Yeah. No, seriously. And just negotiating 
any little thing, you know, how to get a, how to get a dinner table when the restaurant's busy and just, just all that little stuff that it, and it calluses you a little to some extent. But, uh, I think that's been just as helpful. It's what people talk about. And it's something, uh, when folks ask me about entrepreneurship and should they go into business for themselves, if they have that level of uncertainty that they're even asking the question, then the answer is go work for somebody. Learn on their time. Yeah. Go through some experiences. It doesn't have to be more than a year to um, save money because money doesn't make you happy, but it sure as hell buys you a lot of options. Um, and that's key because I don't generally believe in debt. I strongly discourage debt when anywhere possible. Um, and that doesn't work for everybody because it also tends to mean things go slower and they take more time. Uh, but for me as an entrepreneur and as a bootstrapper, it's just the way it's been. I get it. So, John, what drives you personally in your business and in the content? Because you're producing a lot of content, man. So what drives you, what, you know, what, what's compelling you in your business and in the content that you're putting out there and producing? The honest answer? Yeah, I, of course <laughs> I want the honest answer. I don't want you to fake it. No, no, but so, so uh, I got really lucky that when we started this process 10 years ago, I happened to pick YouTube. It wasn't a household name. There was no platform or monetization 10 years ago was a was a long time yeah. for that medium yeah, right it, it was, was it was really in its infancy correct yeah and totally a, a a fluke in that sense so i now sort of feel an obligation because because i love it because we i think we are the kind of largest youtube channel in this cnc spectrum audience and so um but it's always going to be my story like that's what i want it to, to be is this passion of, of sharing and learning um but so what drives me number one i freaking love cnc machining since the day i found it like taking do you, do you get excited when you see the chip flying yes. off the end me too oh my gosh i know absolutely the faster that we can pump yes. up that uh, feed rate it, i know it just if, if it goes at a 45 degree or greater than i get super excited yes so, yeah. you know what i mean rooster nesting and how hard can we push that tool dry so that we can get better rooster tails and i love machining yeah that's at the core of it but um I just always love learning. So like our, some of our most popular videos now are, are these shop tours where we get to travel around the world and see different factories and machine shops, job shops, cool. and pop shops. Um, so that, that motivates me. And, uh, but just, just showing folks you can do it, um, it to me is, is what makes it worth it. You don't have to have, uh, again, multi-generational thing. You know, unfortunately, the U.S. tends to not have the European model of really vested multi-year co-op or uh, what would you call it? Not an internship, but apprenticeship style. Apprenticeship, apprenticeship. Yeah. yeah, like the Germans and everything. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so, so, how do you? I did do one of those. Is that right? Yeah, of course, I did. Back in a long time ago. Is man. that program still around? The Machinist Apprenticeship Program. Correct. Absolutely, one hundred percent. So, but yes, I have been through a formalized Machinist Apprenticeship Program. Decades ago, okay. I learned on the job at my father's company, and we still do formalized apprenticeship programs through a third-party training center. So they go there, they learn the theory. Mm -hmm. They might have some hands-on CNC training there, but really, they're going to get the most of their machining experiences by being in the shop nine hours a day, you know, Trial and error, you know, you're going to put an end mill into the vice. You're going to put a drill into the table. I'm, you know, I'm not going to put them on my brand new horizontal Mazak. I'm going to put them on a 20-year-old CNC machine where I'm not going to cry too hard if they do that. Sure. So. Would so, you agree, though, that that's something that seems to be unique and less common, though, that sort of a apprenticeship program? It doesn't seem unique or uncommon to me because that's all I know. Got it. And that's what I believe in. And I believe because I've been there it's and great. I've done that. Oh, my gosh. Yes. I, I believe it's really powerful. And it's it's very empowering, quite frankly, yep. for that person to do that. They're learning this theory at a third party. And then they're coming and they're applying that theory to actually making, yep. you know, and there's nothing like a veteran machinist telling you, hey, I think you've got that end mill hanging out too far or your setup's really not that rigid. You're going to get a lot of chatter. Right. That bore is going to go oversized the minute you cut that. So yes, all, all of those things. There's well, nothing like on the job. Where, where do you think training is going? I mean, there's a lot of options out there. You you do training at your facility. Um, there's associations that do training. There's pro for-profit organizations. You know, you have videos. I mean, somebody could probably learn how to machine just by immersing themselves in your videos. Yep. Um, you know, Titan, he has his academy, NIMS. Where do you think it's going? Good question. Yeah, everything you just said I think is viable. I think what I, uh, what I try to do is 
let a 13-year-old or a 17-year-old just know what machining is, know that that exists. Too many people don't realize, how did the injection mold that made the shoes that I'm wearing get made? How did that bolt-action rifle get made? I just want you to know that that exists. I don't care if that's not what you want, but I don't want you to realize that existed later in life. And what a machinist is now isn't the same thing when, when certainly Jim, when you would have likely gone through a program, because now it can be, uh, you know, a, a quote unquote machinist could really be somebody whose full-time job is writing custom pro post processors. It could be a full-time cam person. That's almost more like oh. playing a computer game in simulation totally. type stuff. Um, or it could be tool and die. There's so many different uh, avenues of it. And I do think it's going to get a little bit more siloed where you have experts in those respective things. Um, what I do know is um, I struggle with schools. Uh, even the local schools that I try to get involved with, the way the local and city and state and federal programs run is they're behind and they, you know, specific things like continuing to push high speed steel tooling, continuing to push stuff on bridge ports. I'm sorry, I don't need someone to know how to run a bridge port anymore. It's just not. I don't need okay, so I, I do not have any. So you're taking shop. a stand on that because there's a lot of people that that say Boom. you should. I agree with you on that There's one. a lot of people that yes. say you should start with the basics. The joke that we've no. now sort of adopted is I would rather have a student who can talk to me about JavaScript modifying a post-processor than understands power feed on a bridge port. Don't care about the bridge I, port. I agree with you 100% I don't on need, that, man. You don't need to feel what a reamer feels like going through a hole anymore. We have a speeds and feeds library. We have digital tooling. We have, to, we have reps. It's just not... So you th it's not saying I don't like that stuff, but it's not where you should be spending. And when you go through a high school program that's two years, and the last 25 days they introduce them to handwritten G-code, no. Introduce. Introduce. They should have been knowing that from the day one. What is a G what is GO? What is you know, what is a G eighty one? What is an RO plane? What is, you know, a feed rate? So yeah, I, I, totally I, get I it. literally had a conversation, and I didn't even get a chance to tell you about this, Jim, a couple hours ago. I talked with a gentleman named John. He told me, you know, like how do we partner up with you? We're starting our high school machining program. Well, and that's cool to hear that. Yeah, it is great, but you I doubt that they have CNC machines in there. So how do they start? Oh, how do they start? That's a great question. I mean, actually, it must be a better answer for your new creative director. But um, it's a it, Tormach, which where he came out of, is a big part of our story because that's the machine I had in my basement that I got started with. And to me, I always cared more about the ability to go from nothing to something. I was never the guy who was saying myself or advising others, oh, go take out a loan for 100K, buy a vertical machining center. You'll figure it out. You'll throw that thing, you'll throw that ER32 into the chuck in the table and you'll have a five five digit spindle repair. Um, so I like the Tormog for those reasons. They work great for for us nowadays as kind of second op machines, as a training machines. And then we have a very active internship program where we have two or three people coming through pretty regularly. Um, and so those machines are both affordable for schools and I believe there's a fair amount of active kind of grant type money to set up those sorts of labs. So a lot of these high schools could actually probably outsource their their machining program if they needed to. Well, no, what I'm saying is you could probably afford to get uh, enough bridge uh, bridge ports, enough Tormox in, certainly compared to, you know, one uh, one VMC would buy a four Tormox. Right. And to me, if you're a student, you've got to make parts. You've got to figure out coordinate systems. You've got to make those mistakes. You've got to use edge finders. You've got to set up tools. It's not just, hey, we've got well, one. Well, I don't think they even need edge finders. I think they got to have a probe. Sure. They've got to have yeah. a probe. For, I, sure. The edge yeah. finders are gone. Right you know what I mean? Right I don't even think we use, I don't even think we use um, edge finders anymore. We don't sell a lot of edge finders anymore. No, I would no. imagine. Renishaw probes might be where I draw the line, though, on high school kids learning because those, those those are expensive. Yeah, those I know, expensive, and those, yeah. the stylus are expensive to yeah, replace. We I use know timers though, where you can do all three in one, and that's a pretty yeah. common tool. And yeah. uh, anyway, so anyway. You, you would say don't start with the bridge port, though, Correct. even for a high school program. Yeah. So um, this gentleman called me about how how he partners with me. So you know, speaking of partnerships and you know entrepreneurship, I would imagine with the following that you have, you get people all the time calling you up saying, "John, I got a great idea." I want to partner up with you. If somebody comes to you and they're like, John, I have this great idea. I want to go into business with you. No. No. So you've never even like considered I also it. have an article on why we don't do partnerships. Great. It can tell us briefly why. <laughs> oh, uh, you have to tell us briefly why. Because they don't work, period. Well, this worked. Um, uh, jury, jury's out. That's <laughs> <laughs> a good point. <laughs> no. Good and you both have independent, independently we successful careers. We do. And you know we what? Do. I've actually cited that as the reason why. I, and Jim and I, you-, you If this was a real business, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I would I would have killed him three yeah. years ago. We would have Seri needed separate hotel rooms, certainly, when we oh, went to California. I 
I, I, I would have pulled his hair out of his head. Look, yeah. It sounds like you two have complementary skill sets. That's wonderful. Yes. Right. I had that as well in the first business. The, the target business that I alluded to earlier morphed into a camera mount business. Uh, a camera yeah. mount business. Mm, so, interesting. So my partner was a skydiver. Okay. So we were using GoPros. So you have been there. Say again? You have been in a partnership before. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, okay. which was the highs of my life and the lows of my life. Uh, and uh, luckily, in the end, I learned a, a very cheap lesson at an early age, mm-hmm. which which that's the kind of stuff that you can't read in a book. And you can't, you know, even so much as I tell this right now, I'm going to have people who still say, well, I'm still going to do a partnership. Well, I can't help you then. But what I can tell you is that true 50-50 partnerships are very difficult. Uh, the, having the legal aptitude to properly construct a buy-sell agreement is not only expensive, but most people who want to do this don't have the ability to think through that. Um, it's it's very analogous to a prenup with your wife. It's just not a fun conversation. I don't, ha- I don't have one of those to have. Seriously, yeah. yeah. Um, we and, put a lot of time into our you know buy-sell agreement, and I think we we have it at figured out chips. at making chips. And and I don't think we have it figured out. I think it's good. I think, I think it's, it's about as good as it gets. It's very thorough. It was well thought out under a lot of different circumstances. It took into consideration the team that we have and everything because, yep. you know, you, you have a, a fiduciary duty to those people to sure. make sure that they continue to have jobs. And, you know, it worked for you and I with 50-50 when um, it was not our source of income. You know what I mean? We weren't exactly. paying the bills. Now that we're each a third partner, it's it's a little bit different and you have that balance. So Now we're three. Oh, I didn't realize it. Yeah. Okay. Or three. So got it. Yeah, and that's and there's there are exceptions to everything. And again, if you're the type of company that's a true startup where you're raising capital and you have multiple partners and other board, that's totally different. But the some people the, have success with it, John. What was the worst some story people, that came out of your partnership? So it's not. It's a, it's a. I've been fairly public about it. Um, but we ultimately, um, I was not willing to quit my day job. I wasn't willing to to both pour my savings into a business and risk losing my day job income. My partner wanted to move the business to a remote part of the West Coast. He had a different vision of the company. We were different and we and he was it's funny because as much as I uh, was frustrated and disappointed in how this went, I give him a lot of respect as a partner. He was quite good at the things that he did. Um, And we just we just couldn't figure it out. We didn't enjoy working together. And uh, I will say it was we did a good job of putting the systems and processes in place. We ran that company for probably almost another 18 months or two years uh, without really speaking, where we had a 3PL fulfilling orders. We had contract manufacturing building the products. And that in and of itself was pretty cool. But um, we couldn't even figure out how to do a buy-sell, and the company just ended up, you know, others innovated yeah. in the camera mounts beyond what, the design that we had, so it had a natural path natural to closure death. yeah, yeah. sorry that didn't work out Never for you, worked but out okay it for worked you. out for the best so well, i'm not sorry at all i mean okay. truly no like, it, it was good it was it was a great lesson to learn yeah. and, and a point of pride we had some pretty impressive milestones we sold our targets to the navy seals we sold thousands of camera mounts um and that builds a level of confidence you can't replicate as a 26 year old who didn't know what a cnc machine was three years later to be hitting those kind of milestones that is that's fantastic. that's what it's all about one of the things that that I struggle with um, is you you mentioned that one of the things that you love is doing the videos. You love CNC machining, um, and I have the things that I love. Do, doesn't really matter right now. But do you ever get sucked into things that you don't want to do? And how do you how do you keep yourself from getting sucked back out of those? Hmm. You know, uh, so like some of the mundane tasks that you're just like, this is not a good use of my time. Um, I need to be getting somebody else to do this. How do you handle that? Uh, it's it's a great question. And I think we're at a, uh, awkward stage, you know, we're too small to, you know, we're too small to have full-time accountants, HR people. So I'm still doing all of that sort of work. So I think one of the ways that we've tackled that is with technology. We're pretty darn progressive in this industry for making sure we have automation built in. You know, we left QuickBooks with pride because it's a horrible piece of software for that kind of work, for automating that, for integrating with our e-commerce, for inventory, all of that. So investing the time to create those processes. Um, I'm a big believer in uh, the franchise model, even though we're not franchising our business and most machine shops or manufacturing you're, companies aren't you're franchising. You're structured to franchise. Absolutely. Yeah. Have to be. Yeah. So it's just another way of So creating. it's all about 
implementing processes. Bingo. Yeah. And we, and we had a ol- whole episode where our integrator, we work according to the, this business method called EOS, our integrator put a lot of those mm-hmm. processes and systems together, and we don't use QuickBooks either. Um, and I don't know how many he said. It was like 25 different like micro and macro software systems that are all integrated mm-hmm. with each other in order to automate and streamline everything that we do. And yep. it's it's quite fascinating what he did. So I give him a lot of credit for that. Um, John, I would contend that the the metalworking nation, the the listeners of Making Chips are different than the average manufacturing leader. However, a lot of business owners in our industry mostly ride the wave of growth instead of being intentional. How do you manage growth? And have you taken an intentional approach to the growth of your company? Or you have, have you just let yeah. it happen organically? It's, it's a bit organically, but I think... The three sort of segments, you know, YouTube scales naturally, which is quite wonderful. It doesn't really require any additional work on our front. We're a little bit more serious about it. Right. We have a full-time editor. But otherwise, that's that's the one that's awesome because it is a scalable software technology type of platform versus the extreme opposite of a true brick-and-mortar machine tool type business. Sure. Um, the training, we've ramped up more classes. They tend to be sold out. We're sold out through December right now. Um, I don't think I'll scale that business at our shop in Zanesville more than it is right now. And I don't think we tend to scale it to remote sites because that's a very difficult thing to do. So the answer to there has been kind of a, we'll grow it to a certain point and then it's a first come first serve business. Um, and then from a true product and manufacturing side, uh, we have made deliberate investments. We bought, you know, we went from one uh, machine tool you know, one Haas, one vertical machine center to now having four in the last few years. Uh, we've hired some more people. Um, but ultimately I, it's a funny, I also do a podcast and this morning's episode with my other host was about this very topic of as you transition from effectively, what is a lifestyle business? And I don't mean that in the way that the business is run to accommodate my lifestyle, but what I mean is that it's still my business. Saunders Machine Works is not something that would exist for very long without me being there and present. And I don't necessarily want that. But you do have to have some amount of growth to have enough revenue, enough processes in place. You know, I'm still the one that's handling some of the negotiations on, on buying materials and how, how we make decisions about replacing the forklift, that kind of stuff. Um, Are you doing the quoting? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but okay. we don't do that much. Because it's all product-based. Ex- yeah, exactly. Okay. Right. So there's a set price for X, the, Y, and Z. In fact, most of our stuff is e-commerce. Okay. Yeah. Oh, is that right? Okay. Correct. We'll do POs and distributor stuff, but on a... Most of it's just we push them to go direct. Um, and, and so I do want want to grow, but um, to me, I always think about what's what am I getting? What do I want out of this? What's my end goal? And I, I don't actually have a great answer for you. I will say that the business and the trades have been very kind to me. I, I think it's not so common. You find somebody who legitimately enjoys what they do. Um, I hit cycle start less and less every month, and I don't like that. So I choose to not grow to the point where I can't, you know, we got our first five axes three months ago. Darn it. It was fun to just kind of carve out time. Even if that cost you some quote unquote growth to make some fun parts. Uh, we're building a robot from the movie short circuit, the, oh, whole, yeah. the Johnny five, yeah. we're building a full yeah. blown from scratch Johnny five with thousands mm. of parts that cuts into our growth. But what, but what's this all about if we can't have a little bit of fun? I agree. Have you been motivated to say, you know, open up a training center on the West Coast and on the East Coast, you know, and, you know, utilizing? No, no. No, because you just don't want to grow that quickly. Well, or that's not your the reason that you're it's doing not that it. I don't want to it's it, uh, the person I have that runs our classes now is an incredible teacher I'm very happy with it and I don't care to get into the business of so that's a great example what are you selling in that point what I'm selling is no longer a training what I'm selling is my ability to find other people to train them to become expert trainers um, and it's actually really uh, we put a lot of work into our curriculum into having the machine set up all of the we Kanban everything in the training classes itself so that whole our shop basically transforms for like five Five or six days a month into a training facility, which which cuts into some of the production work. So we've streamed, we have to yeah streamlined that process. How do we switch these machines over? All the vices, all the parallels, all the tools. Uh, but it's kind of fun. I like that part. Awesome. We we talked a, a little bit before um, we hit record about we talked about bootstrapping. Um, what is it, and how does that concept fit into your business? Uh, look, there's two constraints in life: money and time. And when you're starting out as an entrepreneur. 
uh, generally speaking, uh, money is much more of the constraint than time. So bootstrapping really ties into your ability to to leverage sweat equity, to pour the time into it, to become experts on this uh, subject matter because you don't necessarily have the money. Stretching the dollars that you do have to go the furthest, triaging your capital, figuring out what do I buy, what do I outsource, how do I think through the goal of developing this product or getting it to market. Um, and to me, there's a whole second level to that, which is which is the character of an entrepreneur. Uh, to me, it's a self-filtering process. If you're not interested or willing to do that, um, as far as an entrepreneur, you're dead to me. If you aren't willing to make that hustle, to read a book about this topic, to figure out how to be an expert on it, even if it's not the end goal, uh, then you're not going to make it, period. You've got to have that drive um, or else go work for somebody, which isn't, it's funny. You, you guys were mentioning that too before we hit record. I, I miss working for somebody and I love being an entrepreneur. But what, what first of all, number one rule, you are not allowed to become an entrepreneur just because you don't like your day job. The two things are not correlated in any way. They're not way. correlated in any way. Um, and I think that's an unfortunate thing where folks will conflate the two because they want they want this vision of the grass is greener, if it's going to be great. I'll tell you, uh, I love what I do and I'm proud of what we built, but some days I miss being told what to do. I can walk into your shop, Jim, and you can tell me, John, this is the machine. These are the parts I need you to make. This is what I expect of you. And that's how I will judge you. Oh, okay. I can do that. Right. Yeah, I you have an objective. You're not, you, you don't have a blank slate in front of you. And I think that's the difference is, you know, do you want that blank slate to create something or do you want to just meet an objective that's given to you? And that's, that, that's a different mindset. Yeah. And as we always say, manufacturing is challenging is. and being an entrepreneur is extremely challenging. And some days I know exactly what you mean. I'm like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this for all these decades? When am I going to be able to take a real vacation? When am I, you know, some of my peers are taking four weeks at a time off. And I'm like, I, I mean, I look at that and I say, oh my God. Put it on your calendar. That's where it starts. No, I can't do that. You could. I, I no, I could. could. First of all, I don't, I don't, is I love my wife I dearly. You, I've been married for 31 years, but I don't think I could go on vacation with my wife for four solid weeks. A. Secondly, um, I, you know, but just the, just the idea that you can take four weeks away and completely let it go, let uh, your job go. I could not do that. I could not do that. I enjoy my, I enjoy entrepreneurship. I enjoy business ownership enough that I want to be engaged most of the time. I can, I can minimize. Yeah, but don't you think maybe at the after it's all over, and maybe you'd be a better entrepreneur. After that, four not weeks. necessarily. Can, no, I ask not you, ne- can I ask you a question? Yeah, go right ahead, if, John. If you and I hopped on a plane right now yes. to somewhere without cell service, and you were there for fifteen days, uh, would car machine be affected? Yes, in, in a negative, in a bad way. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. It on the quoting. Specifically. Uh, yes, because I do ninety percent of all the yep. quoting. But yes, because there would be a deficit. The pipeline would start to diminish. So a. Uh, 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 you know we're pretty siloed. We are wear mm-hmm. a lot of hats. So the, the, I'm responsible for this, 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 and this. Let's say. So if I wasn't there, there would be a definite um, burden yep. on my team. So yeah, that would be for sure. So I, and and I'm not ready to give it up quite yet. Anyway, I I enjoy the daily grind a little bit. Like I said, I'm not willing to. I'm not willing to. Um, completely disengage but i am willing to let go of a little bit on vacation yeah my team would say you were gone well they don't like you <laughs> well so. a, a friend of mine who who's in the industry who i who has been a great person to bounce ideas off of and also built up a really wonderful entrepreneurial story uh his name's jay pearson he runs a work holding company in southern california oh, we buy all we buy all his pearson, uh, yeah. yeah pearson so, work holding so, so great every, stuff every employee at his shop has a major and a minor and so it would be the analogy here would be there's somebody at, at Car Machine who minors in quoting, which means if you are pr- absent, yeah, my for, son could do it. Sure, but um, you know, but you're just he, busy right now. He's got enough. He's got enough responsibilities. I I wouldn't want to put that burden on him. Fair enough. So, I mean, maybe someday, yeah, of course. And we're growing. You know, you know, we're hiring. And anyway, John, entrepreneurial. We're talking about this. Entrepreneurial manufacturers take. Can can take a lot away from this bootstrapping concept, but what does it mean for larger manufacturing businesses? Can they bootstrap? I've never worked at a large company. Fifty million plus sure. a year. 
so I think at some point um, you 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 there's a toggle that switches and you're able to invest in technology that allows you to innovate. Um, but to me, it's not really a question of the size of your company. It's the it's the ethos of not being wasteful. Um, and I think what, what blew my mind was I had the chance to, to tour and film over at, at Sandvik last year in Sweden. And, and they were on their third generation of automated forklift. I don't know what they call them, but they're basically automatic forklifts, unmanned forklifts that have a full-blown system. Ro- that, robotic forklifts, sure. I guess. And, and so on one hand, um, that's extravagant. But on the flip side, number one, it, they are an incredibly popular, excuse me, incredibly profitable company. And number two, um, it's a form of innovation that has helped them sort of shift their workforce. So um, I, I think, I, I don't think anybody likes to see folks being wasteful. And I think that's a harder thing to manage as companies get larger. Right. Um, but if you have the culture of of investing it with with I hate to say result because now I'm sounding like a cliched MBA student, but um, what do you get out of that? Then uh, I think that bootstrap mentality can continue to live on. In other words, you could bootstrap a thirty-seven thousand dollar product, it just happens to be a larger product versus going for the, you know, adding a zero to it. If that makes sense, mm-hmm. I get it. Is, is it Thank just you. is it just a matter of you know making continuous improvements and just working as if you want to drive as much profit to the bottom line or just save as much money in order so you don't take on that debt? Well, bootstrapping as it relates to financing is to me totally different. Okay. Um, and and again, there's lots of different ways to think about it. I've seen folks that do just in time at an amazing level, just amazing how they work with their vendors. And, and that's phenomenal. And I've seen companies that are very respectable who say to hell with that. I want a year's worth of raw material in I don't ever want to run factory, out because that costs period. me and my customers yeah. a lot of money. I don't care what uh, what an MBA student tells me about the reduced ROI because I have working capital tied up. Nope. I'm in the business of making stuff, and I can't make stuff unless it is sitting here on my floor to be made. So that's a, I think that's a question that you need to answer for yourself. Yeah. It's 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 culturally based, you know. It's how you want to run run your business. Well, and also goes it, it goes back to you know the fact that this industry it just it won't be completely commoditized because you have to know the person that you're that you're that you're dealing with. You have to know your clients, and they have different needs. Um, and speaking of that, so let's let's move on a little bit to the content creation side. So, um, making chips are. Our mission has clearly always been equip and inspire manufacturing leaders. So we didn't have that same experience that you did with, with say, NYC, CNC. Jim and I, you know, when when we started making chips, we thought about the times that we were having a glass of wine with a half a dozen, you know, manufacturing peers. leaders, peers, and we're talking about our pains. Yep. And, you know, the pitch was, how do we publicize yep. these conversations? And we even started, like, our first episode was over a glass of wine it was you know part of it was to get used to talking on the microphone but part of it, part of it was also like kind of a um a homage to that th- that sentiment um but who who are you talking to with nycnc who do you really oh. want to inspire when you create yeah the term we use is manufacturing entrepreneur uh, people that want to make stuff and, and for me that that's okay if that's a hobbyist or if it's a weekend warrior um, I don't need to segment them into a true market because I'm not selling them something that they need to the only cost for them is their time of watching and following our story which I hope uh, I will actually don't hope it will always remain a wholesome side of the story um, I do a podcast as well and it's funny what you just mentioned because um, I love what I do I love being an entrepreneur but that doesn't mean on a not uncommon basis. Is I have questions about my decisions. I uh, it can be lonely. I can have questions about my own self confidence. Yep. Um, we we make bad decisions, yep. and I think uh, I, I'm I'm not interested in the fake rah rah happiness. We're always crushing it. We're always busy. And granted, we've had a good ten year run in the U S. So it's been easy to hear that story. Um, but it is not. Yes, it is not. I like to keep. You know, how the heck do you figure out uh, insurance? You know, how do you negotiate a PNC insurance for your for your building? Do you rent a shop? Do I need to buy a CMM next, or do I need to buy automation for my five axis? Or could we, we just th- talked about that today? Is it matter? They're fact? fun to talk yeah. about, but then they're not funny because darn no. it, this is important. This is hard. It's, or, it, or it could be I, I need decision. to hire this person, or this person just gave me their resignation, and I don't know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. So anybody who has those sorts of questions to me uh, is a is a good candidate for for our audience. So John. How, 
how do you believe YouTube and or social media has changed manufacturing and the perception of it? Oh, there's no question uh, the perception is improved, I think, because of what we talked about earlier. Folks see the role in technology. They see automation. They see what a machinist is and isn't in a much easier and dig more digestible way. Uh, and, and, and it's never really changed my perception because that's been my only perception. But we, we get a lot of bad yeah. public PR, right? Sure. Well, when we I see parents of young students who still think that the machine shop is is what what they think of is really a cast iron, you know, casting facility because no. their great uncle lost three fingers right. on the punch press, right? Right. right? And that's all they remember. Right. Well, we don't allow manual lays in our shop for you know, kidding. But um, <laughs> no, it's it's totally different like that. And I think the accessibility. You know, we live in the best country at the best point in time in in human history with the access to learn to to work for somebody else or to work for yourself with this suite of things you would need to succeed as a manufacturing entrepreneur with with things like Instagram with YouTube you can learn it and a lot of times it's not necessarily mastering the content it's just figuring out what the question i need to ask well i th i think that for a lot of reasons and you know part of it is you know thanks to you for you know creating a lot of these videos manufacturing entrepreneurship is really poised to explode even more than what it is now. I think, you know, people get concerned that, you know, like the jobs are only going to go to the big manufacturers. I think it's the opposite. Oh, yeah, sure. I think it's the opposite. I mean, and we, we have, you know, um, friends of ours like like Brandon who you know he's really bootstrapping it in order to create a new business too and I think that is the future of manufacturing and you know thanks to you for helping to drive part of that I do want I do want to touch on that just a little bit though so there my dad always used to say they may know how to run a bridge port but they don't know how to run a business mm -hmm. they're two entirely yeah. different dynamics so it's about being a tactician and then also learning the business there skills. is i mean i think it's very siloed on how to run a machine i think it's a it's a it's a unique skill set but i also think that running a business is very wide you've got to be very um and I don't want to use the word smart, but you got to be resilient. Well, and you have to be willing to learn, like like John said. I mean, that was why, right. why that whole like e myth, um, you know, book was created. I didn't because, read that. Yeah, sorry. I, mean, I know. No, sorry. that's a, I've got him to read one book in the time that we. And I loved it. And I loved it. I got it. And I'm proud of you for reading. Thank that. Thank you. You know, I recommend two books, and that's Go. it. Go. I recommend the e myth revisited. Okay. And I recommend I'll uh, write it down. Dale but Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence oh, yeah. People. It has nothing to do one would necessarily think with business, but it has everything to do with understanding the dynamics of selling because you are always selling. Right now, I am selling Jim and Jason on why they, I was a good decision to come out as a guest host. Yeah, we're selling we're cool, your audience right? on how to uh, on how to listen to the rest of this podcast and not switch it over to the radio. Like you're always selling. Always, always. You're, you're, you're always promoting your brand, right? right. Yes. It's, yeah, selling is not a dirty word. I think it is it, not I think a dirty word. It used word. to be, it'd be like, oh, salesman. No, right. you're right. You're absolutely always selling. This goes back again to like content creation. So, you know, our businesses are a little bit different than yours. You know, you have your, you have your video series, you have, you have your YouTube channel, you have your training and you have your own line of products. Um, Jim's business is, I would say more along the lines of traditional B2B, your B2B as well, but maybe, you know, J Jim's a contract manufacturer. I'm a tooling distributor. Um, could we, or companies like us, utilize you know social media or youtube in order to you know grow their business or just meet the objectives that I we have in our business that question of course I, we well can. i know but i want to hear yeah. it from john he's yeah. you know he yeah. has more credibility with me than well, you no. do john yeah Jim. no he does yes but but i would i would challenge it with what's the what's the goal here and, and who are your customers um i see a, a fair amount of social media done wrong uh, regurgitating a corporate PDF into an Instagram post, you're, 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 you're dead to me. Like, I'm not going to look at that. It's not interesting. To me, you've got to be a, a little bit more insightful, uh, sometimes self-deprecating. Um, and, you know, for companies like uh, yours, Jim, YouTube may just be the best vehicle for you for recruiting. It may have nothing to do with your customers. Right. Um, so it's what are you trying to do with it? Um, and and how are you trying to change the perception? Because keep in mind, nowadays, you, you know, you talk about recruiting workforce, you've got to sell to them too. And so when I go Google companies and you can't even find them. I mean, they don't even have a website? Different, yeah. Or, or they have a website that's bad or, or there's, you know, 
it's a question of what do you want to do? What story do you want to be part of? Sure. Uh, how do you want to interact with that? With what you're doing, I don't know as much about your business, but there's some pretty cool stuff and disruptive stuff going on in that industry. So how are people implementing um, tool cribs is the one that's been on my mind a lot, or vending machines or automation or tying into ERP systems. These are real problems. Yeah, and unfortunately, we're doing some disruptive stuff. We're just not public about it. So. Intentionally? What's that? Intentionally public not, or private um, or just haven't gone around to talk? I would say partially intentional and, and partially um, because we just don't haven't had the time, yep. you know, um, you know, busy with making chips and also busy with the growth. So but we need to become intentional. So what what mistakes have you seen people make? Like you, you mentioned regurgitation. You mm -hmm. mentioned maybe not um, be, being honest about who you are and showing your, you know, your 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 bumps and your bruises and stuff like that. It's 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 actually incredibly easy to succeed with things like social media. Just go look at what you like. Go look at what your employees like to see. Go look at what other people are engaging with. So I'll give you an example. A machine tool builder that's getting ready for emo right now, if they're putting out Instagram videos... Getting ready for what? Oh, emo. Emo, emo the yeah, yeah. big trade show. Yeah, in if Germany. They're, if they're putting yeah. out videos showing, hey, here's how we create up the machine. That's actually kind of interesting to some people. Or here's the challenges. Or hey, I would never... I would not know how that's done, right? It's probably... Quite yeah, it's kind of interesting. It's right? kind of interesting. Or like, <laughs> uh oh, we, we goofed on this. We were going to figure this out. Or here's the test cuts that we're trying to figure out versus uh, another company that said, we're proud to announce that Craig Craig XYZ has been promoted to the senior vice president, oh. regional managing director in, in conjunction for the trade show. Uh, so, right? Yeah, we, I know. It's, what, it's what not hard to make that boring as hell. What that distills down to is it's not about me, it's about you. It's not about what my company gets out of this. It's not about my new Big product. Way. Don't overtly sell this to me. You may have a really, really, really cool new automation system, but you don't have to throw it in your face about what we have just come out with, what I've just come out with. Throw spin it around and say, hey, this is this is what we're hoping is gonna work or change or show it in in situ. Um, in a in a more subtle, more more community social media. It's supposed to be a communication. It's supposed to be a two way conversation. Not you're just not a, just pushing. Exactly you're pulling too. Yeah, right. I I totally get it. And and then that and that has to should be intentional. How about one last question, Jim? Go ahead. Yeah, I've got it. I've got it right here. So, John, you know, it's been a pleasure. I've I've never talked to you. I've never met you before, obviously. And quite frankly, I'll be quite honest. I haven't watched all that many of your videos so just it's just no offense taken yeah not at all but it, i i will admit that it, i really have genuinely enjoyed talking to you and, and sharing your story Jim's kind of afraid to go to the shop anyway so you know what <laughs> use would he have for one no i am I, i'm i'm one thing i am i'm i'm really sincere um, about my intentions and i just want to tell you that but you know you you've had a lot of success over the last 10 years what do you see in the next short term one to three years and a lot can happen in one yep. to three years but what do you see uh, NYC, CNC, and SMW doing in the next one to three? Sure. Training classes, uh, we're going to be adding a fifth axis class because okay. we had so much demand. Oh, that has yeah. completely rejuvenated my passion. Uh, it's just, you know, I, I, don't know what, I don't know how to say this other than I got tired of doing six setups and all that hassle and soft jaws mm -hmm. and sign vices because I don't have that much time right. and I don't enjoy it anymore and I know I can do it so I don't need to prove it. Um, and so having a five axis now where we can do that stuff has been completely amazing. It's completely changed uh, how I work with others and thinking about recommending their first machine or their second machine because it's just been that. And I may be behind the times compared to some of your audience who have multiple machines, but darn it, there's plenty of three axis shops out there where I'm not thinking, holy cow. Um, for me, so, so training, we're going to add that. YouTube, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. I love, um, you know, we have the unique chance to basically film where many others don't because of this brand that we've built, which is pretty darn cool. I, I, I will never tire of touring factories. I will be pitching Jim later and maybe even you, Jason, to come see the insides of your shops love and that. film them and share that insight. How do you do things? What is difficult? What's your story? Uh, what are you good at? What are you not good at? That's another great thing for entrepreneurs. Be okay with what you're not good at, but then figure out how to supplement that. Um, and then for Saunders, um, we need a second five axis. I need to get a joke aside, joking aside, I need to get a lathe. I'm looking at a CMM, uh, that five axis I'd like to get with automation, uh, which ties into one of my favorite sayings, which is growth eats cash for breakfast. 
It certainly does. And lunch, too. Yeah, right? And lunch. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, well, John, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you for being here with us and for breaking from your vacation. And please yeah. tell your wife thank you for letting you go for a little while, unless she was Enjoy happy to Chicago. let you go. Man. Thank you. Thank you again for coming on the show. Thank you, Jim, Jason. Pleasure. So, Jim, what did you learn something here? I learned a ton. Um, I learned that it's okay to not be okay. I, I actually wanted to talk to you about that. I mean, I think that, I, you know, I don't think like self-deprecating is, you know, maybe the right word to, to use with you. But like, talk about the mistakes you make and the issues you have and stuff like that. And I think that talk that about will... Talk my mistakes? Yeah, I think that will... I know, I know you don't like to say you're sorry. No, um, no. You know, or maybe well, it's just you don't like to say you're sorry to me, but... Where if I made mistakes? I mean, we've all made mistakes. Um... Oh my God! I made a ton of them. Why don't my, we do a whole episode about all the mistakes that we've made? That could be for our two hundred. I've got, I've got several. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, like because that. we all make mistakes, and you know, if you're not making mistakes, you're never going to grow, and you're not making money. If you're not, well, that's true. If you're not, if you're not making mistakes, you're not making money. Bam, bam. 